Hello everybody, this is Tim here again, here to do my review for Nightmare Number Street 4, The Dream Master. Just got yeah, my four pack here. Um, this is my favorite sequel in my last review for Part 3 at the beginning of it. I incorrectly said that Part 3 is my favorite sequel, but that's not what I meant to say. I meant to say Part 4 is my favorite sequel. Uh, but yeah, Part 4 is my favorite sequel. It's my personal favorite. I do know that 3 is a better movie than Part 4. But I do think that 3 is the best. I do think that number 3 is the best sequel. And uh, But uh, this film is more personal for me since it's the one I watched the most as a kid. And I feel more connected to the main character of this film, the character of Alice. Because she reminds me a lot of myself. So that's why I feel more personally connected to this film. And it's also why I picked this film as my personal favorite of the franchise. It's why I like it the best, you know, personally. But I still know that number but I still know that number three is a better film. But um uh, jump straight into the film here. It's not too long after number th uh, number three. Um, the, uh, the last uh, surviving dream uh, dream warriors are out of the uh, asylum, and they're now living normal lives, well, except for Kristen, played by Tuesday Night in this film, instead of Patricia Arcant, which is kind of a downer. I miss Patricia Arcant in this film, but Tuesday Night, she's alright, and she sings the opening song for the film, uh, Running From This Nightmare, which I really like, and it's a good, really great song. Um... And she does a good job singing it as her as uh, Patricia Arkin's replacement. Her acting isn't as good, but she's she's all right. She's not horrible. She's decent. Um, <clears throat> Freddie is in the limelight completely in this movie. Freddie is the hero of this film. The me the metamorphosis that started with Dream Warriors is complete here. Freddie is now uh, the hero of the franchise. And but we're gonna embrace that angle, at least make it fun. And I, I feel like this film is really fun. It's got a lot of rockin' eighties tunes in it that I love. It's got a terrific soundtrack. Um Um Nothing quite as cool as Docking from the Dream Warriors song from the last film, but Are You Ready for Freddy by the Fat Boys is still pretty fucking pretty fucking cool. But um still this film is just it's just got a rockin' eighties vibe to it that I just love. I just can't get enough of it. I eat it up. Um, but jump straight in, back into the plot here. You got Kristen, who's like the only one that won't let go of the idea that Freddy's gonna come back. And she's like having a. She goes into Freddy's dream world to look around for him, to uh, like try to see if he's come back. And she and they, Joy and Kincaid basically tell her if she keeps going in, she might stir him up again. But she doesn't. She doesn't listen. So she keeps going in. And at the beginning of the film, she's having this nightmare. Uh, well, it's the opening nightmare of the film. She sees like this little girl outside the Elm Street house, and uh, she's like, "Where's uh, Kristen's? Like, where's Freddy?" And the little girl goes, "He's not home." And all at once, it starts raining, and she's like, "The little girl is like drawn like a chalk uh, <laughs> picture of the Elm Street house." Uh, and then uh, Kristen goes inside the Elm Street house and fucking like she sees, uh, she thinks it's Freddy's hand, but it's actually like a tree, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, and not once the windows like explode and she flies backwards down into the boiler room, which has chains in it for some reason this time. Kind of seems like they're trying to, uh, rip off Hellraiser a little bit. Because I think Hellraiser came out around the same time and it's kind of like they didn't want Hellraiser to take the, take the place as like the pinhead or whoever I guess to take the place as the new mega horror movie icon away from Freddy since this was like the height of his popularity. So, uh, they kind of, uh, stole a little bit from Hellraiser in this movie, I'll admit. It does seem like they've stole a little bit from Hellraiser. With the chains hanging in the boiler room, and also there's a scene where Freddy says, uh, Alice, come to daddy, which reminds me a lot of Frank's line in Hellraiser. Um, <clears throat> but, um, anyway, enough about artistic thievery, I guess. <laughs> Let's talk about the rest of the film. So, Kristen is now in the boiler room, which now has chains in it. Um... And then uh, Joey and Kincaid, she brings them into the, the to the dream world. Uh, but she accidentally brings like fucking uh, Kincaid's dog in there, and it like leaps out of the <laughs> leaps at her and like bites her on the arm, and she wakes up and her arms like bleed. Then you got like a really spooky music tune playing. I like the I like the score in this film. I enjoy it. Um, and then uh, you get to hear like a uh, rocking song, uh, a rocking eighty song. I don't know what band it is. Uh, when she wakes up, it's like, we're living in desperate times. These are desperate times, my dear. <laughs> but uh, but it kicks ass. I really love it. I don't know who sings that. I forgot the name of the band, but it's just awesome. Um, 
And so you find out Kristen has a has a boyfriend in this uh, this film called named Rick. I like this actor, the the character Rick. I like the character Rick. I would have rather he he have lived in the film to be honest. Uh, he's very likable. This is the last film where I actually care about the characters in the franchise. After this, I don't give a shit about anybody, not one person, um, other than Freddy, really. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is the last film with really likable characters, and Rick's really likable. And then you get introduced to Alice, who's his sister. It's kind of like this bookwormish, uh, well, not so much bookwormish, but kind of shy type, shy, conceited girl because. Her father is like a uh, is abusive towards her and her brother because their mother is dead and he's an alcoholic now and he's like taking it out on them, and uh, she kind of like shelters herself and uh, is real shy and doesn't talk much and everything. It's kind of like her way of dealing with her uh, abusive father, I guess. Um, so that's that's her. She has a, a much more interesting character arc than Alice. I mean, than Nancy has ever had. Uh, in any of the films, but Nancy had the benefit of being in the better films, which is probably why she's the fan favorite, plus she was in the first film. But uh, Alice is uh, number one for me all the way, because she just has a much more interesting character arc than Nancy ever had. Um, but um, <clears throat> So you can introduce those characters, and then they go to school. Uh, <laughs> Rick, the, oh yeah, before I forget, the character of Rick likes to like climb down the top of the house. It's really, it's it's funny because he's like, it's avoid all contact day. He's like, when uh, dad's popping aspirin like popcorn, it's avoid all contact day. <laughs> and his dad walks out there and he's like, waiting for a limo. And uh, Rick walks up to him and kisses him on the side of the face. He's like, I'm off to the club, honey. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Some good humor there. Uh, like I said, the characters are likable. And they're all at school. You get introduced to some of the, some of the newer characters here. Uh, you get introduced to this jock. His name is Dan, who Alice has a crush on. And he's like a friend of Rick's. Um, he's kind of a blank slate, really. I, the actor's not like horrible, but uh, I mean he's decent. He's decently likable, but the character's just not that interesting to me personally. But uh, and then you get introduced to this character named Debbie, who's like this tough chick who has like a phobia of bugs. I wonder if Freddy will exploit that. Wink, wink, <laughs> in her nightmare sequence. But um, then you get introduced to this character named Sheila, who's like this nerdy girl. Um. Uh, the Dream Warriors, one of the problems with the film is the Dream Warriors get wiped out way too quick. In the last film, though, there was a bunch of them, and to be honest, if there wasn't that many, they would have probably have got wiped out pretty quick. And they do even get wiped out quick at the end of the film when they actually try to fight Freddy. But still, it seems like they should have been more important to the plot. Freddy's Reser uh, you get well, you do get a stupid scene here where there's like a bunch of claw marks on the uh, lockers at school. There's no reason for it to be there. Uh, it's just there to let the audience know that Freddy's coming back. That's the only reason it's there. The only reason it's there is just a visual thing. There's no fucking purpose for it at all. But, uh, I mean, it looks good, but there's no reason for it. Um, Joey and Kincaid are there at school talking to Kristen, telling her, you know, maybe you should stop going in. It might stir Freddy back up again, which Freddy's resurrection, resurrection in this film is just kind of, like, abrupt. It just seems like it comes out of nowhere. But if you listen to this line right here, it's kind of like that because she is the only one that's still afraid of Freddy. He's like feeding off her fear and she keeps going into his world messing around and that's kind of the reason he came back. But still, I wish they would have delved in a little bit more to explain explain it you know, completely to why he comes back. But they drop enough information about it to let you know that she's the reason he's come back. So it's pretty much Kristen's fault. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Uh, Kincaid is the first one who has a, a Freddy nightmare. He has a nightmare about Freddy. He's like in the junkyard from the ending of part three. And the, the look of the, the junkyard and everything looks really awesome. And it's kind of like the whole world in this nightmare is like a fucking junkyard. And the whole planet is full of junk. It's like cars and well, broken down cars and shit. Like the whole planet's full of it. Because you get a scene where Kincaid's like looking up to the sky going, Kristen, Freddy's back. <laughs> And just fucking it like zooms up and it shows like the whole planet covered with cars like the whole world is that one junkyard like endless over and over <clears throat> that was cool great visual shot this film is directed by Rennie Harlan who's directed some really fun action films it's also directed so he's also directed some shitty movies but he's direct he his his direction is mostly like to be really fun and to do some like really clever and fun stuff and I think he succeeds here um he's more of an action guy and he succeeds here and this film has way more of an action tone to it in the other films, uh, the, uh, which explains why this film was number one at the box office, that and the fact that it's just, this was like from the height uh, off of part three, which was really popular too, so people were already wanting to see this one, and this film not being that bad itself, 
<clears throat> combined with the rock and rock and music in the film, or the rock and rock and roll music in the film, I mean. And he combined that with all the action and fun of the film. This film is just a lot of fun. Um, that automatically is going to make this film, you know, 90% probable huge hit. Um, the film does have problems, though. It feels rushed in certain areas, but we'll get to that. So, um, you got Kincaid having the nightmare about where he's in the fucking uh, junkyard. Uh, you get a funny-ass scene here where Kincaid's dog, like, pisses fire. For, it's kind of silly, but I, I I like it. It's like a pimp entrance for Freddy Krueger. The fucking ground, like, splits apart from the piss, from the fire piss. Fucking Freddy's bones are in there, and they all connect together, and his body, like, regrows organs and everything, and, like, get, basically rebuilds itself. And he comes up out of the ground, you get, like, a badass Freddy line where he's like, You shouldn't have buried me. I'm not dead. I like that. That was funny. Well, not so much funny, but it was just cool. I like that. That was entertaining. And uh, you get another scene here, which I like, where Kincaid gets to drop on him and fucking knocks an old car down on top of him. He's like, ah, take that, motherfucker. <laughs> I like that. That was entertaining. Uh, of course, Freddy isn't dead, and he ends up cornering Kincaid and grabs him and stabs him in the gut. And you get another cool line here. This film has some cool lines in it, just like part three and the ones before. Um, but, uh, he stabs Kincaid in the gut, and Kincaid's like, I'll see you in hell, and, he, and Freddy goes, tell him Freddy sent you. <laughs> that was a cool line, that was a good line. So, Kincaid's dad, next you get Joey getting killed, the Dream Warriors are getting killed off too quick for my taste, but at least they get cool deaths. <laughs> I mean, deaths are cool, they're entertaining. Uh, Joey has a dream where he's, like, on his waterbed, and he fucking, like, pulls the blanket off, and there's some, like, some hot chick there with, <laughs> exposing her breasts. <laughs> So I'm like, once again, Joey's weakness is hot women. <laughs> then it turns into fucking Freddy Krueger, and he leaps up out of the waterbed and grabs Joey and says, How's this for a wet dream? Which is another memorable line. Once again, another memorable line. And he fucking, like, cuts Joey all the pieces inside the waterbed, and there's blood getting mixed in with the water, and that's Joey's death scene. The next morning, though, you get, like, a stupid scene the next morning where his mom, Joey's mom, finds him, like, inside the waterbed, and I'm like, why the fuck would Freddy do that with somebody? It's supposed to make them the deaths look like an accident. It's like saying or uh, suicide or something. So that kind of seems kind of stupid. I mean, how the fuck are they gonna explain that one? But whatever, it's still entertaining. Um, then you got um Kristen who's like you know starting to freak out because she ain't seen Joey and Kincaid around any anywhere, and she's already been afraid that Freddy's gonna come back. Um, she accidentally freaks she freaks out in uh, class because Joey and Kincaid aren't there, and she accidentally gets knocked out. She has a fucking nightmare with Robert England dressed up in a nurse's outfit. And uh, he's like, and then he transforms into Freddy and he's like, I want to draw some blood. And he's got like these uh, blood vials, like tubes or whatever. He's holding them and if you look close, one of them says England on it, on one of the stickers on one on one of them. <laughs> Took me forever to see that myself personally. Even, I didn't see that until after like the first hundred times I watched this movie. But anyway. And then uh, she wakes up. Uh, she, uh, she wakes up from it, and the real nurse is like woke her up with some smelling salt or something. I'm not for sure. And um, and so she's like um, telling uh, all the, but well, she's telling Alice and uh, uh, and the re the rest of her friends and everybody. And well, Rick's telling everybody too about uh, the legend of Freddy and shit like that. And till they're telling Dan about it, and they're showing the Dan like the fucking uh, Elm Street house. Which you would think with the uh, people of the town would just tear down, you know, but it's still there, so who knows. <clears throat> but uh, he's telling the, well, she's telling everybody about it, and Rick's telling everybody about it. And so, uh, of course, no one believes it right up front, of course. And so, uh, Kristen, uh, her Kristen's mom ends up coming and picking her up, and you find out Kristen's mom has dosed her with sleeping pills in her water to make her f pass out. Or to go to sleep, I mean, because she's been worried about her not sleeping, even though her mom's like a total asshole. At least she was an asshole in the last film. She doesn't seem to be much better here. Um, so she finally falls asleep, Kristen does, and you get a funny, like, Jaws homage and nightmare scene here where Kristen's, like, having a nightmare where she's on the beach. She thinks it's a pleasant dream, though, and then fucking, like, Freddy's hand comes up straight out of the water like as Glove does and zooms straight through it. Like a shark fan, it looks like a shark fan, it fucking goes straight on the beach, and then bl blows up a sandcastle, and you're like, oh shit, that's one dangerous fucking shark, man, if Jaws was like that, shit, if he can even come on land, that'd fucking shit my pants, but I guess this is a Freddy shark. Uh, but, uh, then of course it's Freddy, and this scene right here, coming up next, uh, Kristen takes off running, she starts like sinking in the sand on the beach, uh, and then you see Freddy pretty much 
uh, full makeup on the beach. I believe his makeup once again is done by Kevin Yeager, and it looks like more like a redefined version of the one from Part Three. Um, but um, you get a goofy fucking scene here where Freddy like picks up some shades and is like puts them on, like looking directly at the camera. I'm like, okay, that's a little much for me, a little too silly for me. The putting on sunglasses is, but it fits the tone. It does fit the tone of the movie. But still, it's a little too silly for me with the Freddy character doing that. And then he like puts his uh, boot on top of her head and pushes her on down into the sand where she's sinking, which is <laughs> which is funny. And uh, she sinks down th uh, through the hole, and she's in the Elm Street house now. And she makes it down to the fucking boiler room where all the chains are. And um, there's uh, Freddy showing up again. He's like Elm Street's last brat. Farewell. I think Freddy's most memorable lines or close to his most memorable lines are in this film. Or a lot of his mem most memorable lines are in this film. Um, so he's got her in there. He's got her in the boiler room. He's trying to get her to bring someone into her dream. And she brings Alice there. Um, because she's starting to be good buddies with Alice. And Alice knows like this corny sounding dream master rhyme. That's a little silly. It's kind of basically like the uh, Lord's Prayer I believe. Now lay me down to sleep. Except like a little, uh, little switched around. Um, so uh, she's been becoming you know good buddies with Christian. And Christian's there, and for some reason, Freddy grabs her and fucking, like, <clears throat> slings her into a, a fire, and she's, like, getting killed. And I'm like, why would Freddy kill her? Because if you know anything about this uh, film, if you've seen it before, you know that Freddy needs Christian to bring him the other Elm Street kids. Or needs someone with that ability. Was he counting on the fact that she would send her power in Alice like she does? Or what? I don't know. That kind of seems like a little bit of a plot hole there, or just a little bit underwritten. But uh, so she th he throws her into the into the fire and she fucking like sh sh her shoots her power and it goes through Freddy and then go shoots in Freddy's back and then flies out his chest and it hits into Alice. So now Alice has Kristen's power to bring people into her dreams, which Freddy wants to exploit and use that power because now that the last Elm Street kid is dead, he can't move on to new prey without a uh, huh. He, he's, he's like bound by the Elm Street kids or to them, and he can't move on to the new kids without someone to bring them to him. So he needs to use uh, uh, Alice's ability now, her dream power that she's got from Kristen, to bring the uh, new kids into her dream so Freddy can kill them. So that's a really interesting idea. I like that idea. So, uh, oh, you get a funny scene where, like, after Alice wakes up, she sees, like, a picture on her fucking window, or, I mean, her mirror that says, it's got a picture of, uh, Freddy holding Kristen, and it says, uh, greetings from hell, greetings from hell, and I thought that was funny as fuck. <clears throat> so, it's like, after Kristen's dead, Rick's, like, feeling like shit, and, uh, I'll sympathize for Rick, I think the actor does a good job, and his relationship with Alice, you get a lot of cutesy moments where he's, like, telling her she needs to stand up to her, stand up to their dad, like he does, you know, fight back. Because he doesn't put up with the shit that his dad does as much as she does. Um, so, you know, you feel for him. And especially since now he's lost, you know, his girlfriend who he loved. You know, Kristen, you know, you feel for him. He's a, I mean, he's a very likable character. And, they're, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. I mean, uh, through the movie, uh, the character of Alice, not only, like, well, she starts absorbing the dream powers that each character has. But she also gets the traits. <coughs> she also gets the traits of each person. Which is pretty entertaining. I like little traits like Kristen smoked and then Alice would like jerk out a cigarette and she'd go, wait, I don't smoke. Which you'd think, you know, why the fuck would you think she would thought of that when, before she bought the fucking cigarettes or while she was buying them. But I get why it's there and it's nice there to be there, but it doesn't make much sense. But, um, but I don't harp on that too much. That's just a little thing. But anyway, um. So yeah, for some reason she's able to absorb the powers of each person because she is the Dream Master. Now, an idea like this of a character having all the dream powers like that and Freddy having all the souls of the victims is pretty cool. You know, someone that can really face off against Freddy in actual combat is a really cool thing. That's a really cool idea. But uh, it doesn't really explain how she's able to do these things. In the movie, you get like a Bob Shea doing a cameo where he's like a fucking teacher explaining stuff about like these... uh. Tribe, this tribe, I believe, or something like that, who uh, um, believe that there was uh, two that uh, w that when you dream, your soul like roams free, and the stuff it sees is dreams. Like your soul goes to the dream world, is what it is, and it has two places it can enter: a positive gate or a negative gate. Kind of like dreams are like the pathway to the afterlife or something like that. 
Um, and Alice is gonna is the guardian of the positive gate. Of course, Freddy guards the negative gate. And uh, Freddy is is killing the people and taking the souls for himself, basically. So, and she's like there to stop him now. She's like the pot, the yin to his yang. But um, I mean that's a cool idea, but they don't really delve into it enough. I mean, I need a little bit more explanation than that. Than that, maybe I'm just stupid. I don't know. They just don't they just don't delve into it enough for my taste. They don't really explain like um why Alice is chosen to be the guardian of the positive gate. Was she always the dream master? Is she just now like awakening to this ability? Were there other dream masters? I don't know. It doesn't explain. But uh, but it, the film makes up for it with the fun. With the fun, it makes up for it. Any little. It seems like the film was kind of written quick, and that uh, they kind of covered up some of the holes in the script with you know extra fun and stuff. Uh, maybe it's extra gloss if you want to say that. But uh, it works. I mean, I have fun with it when it's fun. So, of course, uh, then you get uh, Alice falling asleep in class, and she has a nightmare where the Sheila gets brought in now, her uh, her uh, nerd friend. Um, so uh, Sheila's, ha Sheila's like a character that has asthma. She's like a, she's like writing on her test paper and fucking it, uh, the pen's like dripping blood, and on the paper it says, learning is fun with Freddy. I thought that was funny. <clears throat> and then like this fucking weird ass robot arm like pops out and grabs her hold of her face and she like pushes the arm back down into the paper and her hand her whole arm like goes through the desk and she pulls it back out. It like morphs like through the desk and she pulls it back out. Well not morphs but like goes through the desk I guess or through the, her test paper and she pulls her arm back out and then fucking Freddy appears up there as, as the teacher <laughs> and he walks down there and fucking like uh, Robert England does his tongue, his amazing tongue movement, and <laughs> fucking is like, want to suck face, is what he says to her, and he grabs her and like, fucking kisses her and like, sucks her soul clean out of her body, and makes it look like she has an asthma attack, it's a really cool scene, I like the effect, you like see her body deflating, <laughs> I thought that was funny, that was a cool death scene, this film has, uh, this film has some memorable death scenes in it, and they're very enjoyable, so that was cool, um, so then, of course, Alice, you know, is freaking out even more because now she's the one that Freddy's using to bring her friends in. So it's a lot of, you know, responsibility and hardship, you know, placed on this character. And where she's, like, sheltered like that because of her abusive father, she's, like, uh, got all these pictures on the mirror because she doesn't want to see herself or see who she really is as a person or discover who she really is. Instead, she just wants to hide and, well, whimper and just not show herself, which is, a uh, Really cool character arc because every time one of her friends dies, she has to take like their picture off her mirror, and she sees more and more of herself for who she is and discovers who she is. And that's a much more interesting character arc than anything any of the other people in this entire franchise really has done. But um, so I gotta hand it to Rennie Harlan there. That was cool. The Alice character, A plus. But um, let's keep going here. And of course now it's Rick's turn. Her brother, which I don't really think should have died. I would have rather have him have lived. And his death sequence is pretty lame. He fucking like falls asleep on the shitter <laughs> at school. And uh, the makeup effects and the special effects in this film are either are either the best or second best of the franchise. And he has a nightmare where he sees like a uh, uh, Kristen who like turns around, and looks at him, and she's like melded and stuff. But I mean, she's supposed to be she's supposed to be melded and burned up, but it kind of just looks like they threw like some black face paint all over her face. Or some black, you know, makeup or whatever. Like looks like black tar or something. Doesn't she doesn't really look burnt up. So that was a little weak. This fucking elevator, like the bathroom stall like turns into an elevator and it like goes like super fast and that's pretty neat. And then he you know, it opens and he's like fucking in some kind of dojo, like Japanese dojo samurai looking place, ninja place I believe. And uh Freddy's there and he's invisible and oh in the in the film Rick like likes to work out and stuff and practice fighting and martial arts and shit. But, uh, which would be a neat thing with him, like, challenging, challenging Freddy to Mortal Kombat or whatever, but Freddy's, like, fucking invisible, so you don't even see Freddy. I'm like, okay, that's a little lame. He's the main draw of these films, so if he's, you don't even see him, but what the fuck is the point? But anyway, um, so he's beating the shit out of Rick because he's invisible, and then Rick does, like, a kick and knocks Freddy's glove off, and he's like, how are you going to fight me without your weapon, Freddy? And his fucking glove comes to life flies directly towards him and fucking like impels him straight in the chest which that was okay but next scene uh you get a really dramatic scene here where alice is like 
goes, no, you know, after she woke up and she, like, fucking slams her hands down on the desk and the fucking windows explode. Um, it's a really dramatic scene. It's really cool. I like that. It really gives Rick's death really a lot of impact. But it's kind of a question of, like, how the fuck was she able to make those windows explode like that or why did they explode? I guess not only does she have her friend's powers, but she has the Dream Warrior's powers, too. It doesn't, it doesn't really clarify. So maybe she has um, Joey's super sound. But then again, if she does, how is she able to use them in the real world? I guess it could kind of be like Freddy, where Freddy, the more souls he gets, the more he's able to manipulate the real world. So maybe the more power she gets, the more she's able to manip manipulate the real world. I'd buy that. And it makes sense. So I'm kind of willing to let that one go a little. But it's still a really cool scene, so fuck it. But um, like I said, if the movie is really entertaining, then it'll make up for any kind of little shortcomings that it has. So it's Rick's death, and you get a really heartfelt scene here where the character Rick like comes up out of his coffin. He's like, "Hello, baby," because Alice like through the movie has like little daydreams because uh, <clears throat> she kind of like escapes to her own fantasy world because she doesn't want to deal with the harshness of reality. And she has a daydream where it's like Rick's alive, and he like tells her it's just a trick to fool Freddy. And that's when she decides she doesn't want to daydream anymore. She like puts a stop to it right there. That's a really heartfelt scene, and I felt sad for Alice right there. And sad for the character of Rick, and that was a good scene. Um, you got a scene earlier in the film where her dad's like comes home from work, and he's like dissing her about the food she's made for him or whatever. And she's like, um, she has a daydream where she's like, what she wants to say to him, and she like, she says, um, yeah, I can think of how sick I am of you drinking your life away and taking it out on me. That was entertaining. I wish she would have said that to him because he treats her like shit. He's like looking at the food she's made him because he's been working for 10 hours and he comes home drunk. And he's like, you call this vegetation a meal after a 10-hour work day? What the hell am I, a rabbit? <laughs> I thought that was funny. But he's still an asshole. So, um, pretty well, after Rick's dead now, you do get a little heartwarming scene here kind of with her father. Who, like, tells her that uh he lost Rick because he didn't watch and he doesn't want to lose her too. So... I like that. Kind of redeems that a little bit. Shows that he actually does give a fuck, <laughs> despite it all. But um, so Alice wants to sneak out. She wants to go over to her friend Debbie's and make a plan about how to beat Freddy. And fucking Dan is supposed to pick her up. And they're starting to. Dan's pretty much starting to realize that she's got the hots for him, and they're starting to you know kind of lean towards being a couple. And um, so we're. Uh, she fucking has, thinks she's going out, but she's really in a nightmare, and she, like, wanders into this theater, and, um, she's in there, and the fucking movie that's playing is, like, at, her transforms into, I believe it's Reefer Madness that she's watching, I'm not for sure, which I think may have been New Line Cinema's first release, but, um, she's having the, she's, like, well, she's looking at the fucking screen, she's obviously in a dream, and the screen, like, turns into the diner that she works at, and everybody in the theater who's watching the movie are people that's died in the film thus far. And all at once, she fucking, like, gets sucked into the theater screen. Uh, sucked into the black and white theater screen, which is a really cool scene. And she gets in, the, she walks into the diner, and she said in the film her greatest fear is to be working there in that diner forever. And fucking, it's her in there in the diner, and she turns around and says, uh, what'll it be? Come on, honey, I don't want to work here forever. <laughs> or be here forever. And I thought that was, that was funny. I like that. And then you get a cheesy line from Freddy, though, where he's like, uh, if the food don't kill you, the service will. And I'm like, uh, that's a little too cheesy. But this is a really cool scene here where <clears throat> he has a fucking um, soul pizza with meatballs all over it. It's like characters' heads who have died. And he says, Rick, you little meatball, and fucking jabs Rick's head and eats it. I thought that was funny. That was entertaining. I love that. Um, uh, and, uh, and then she, well, of course, she brings Debbie into the dream world now. So Freddy's going to kill her. Uh, and Freddy says, your shift is over, your shift is over, and fucking, like, swings his hand, like, glove towards her face, and she wakes up, that was entertaining, um, Robert England, once again, is A-plus as Freddy, nobody can re replace him, and then this is the film where he gets top billing, and rightfully so, because this is his movie, baby, he's rocking the house here, um, and so, uh, she, she thinks she's awake, but of course it really was a dream within a dream, and she tries to go save Debbie, but her and Dan are both asleep, and they're going around in circles in Dan's truck. And I'm kind of thinking, so they're both asleep? When did Dan fall asleep? Did he actually fall asleep at home, or did he fall asleep waiting there at the fucking truck? Because eventually they try to run Freddy over. They see him on the road, and they actually hit a tree, and they're both in the vehicle. So 
But the idea that he's got them both running around in circles, though, is pretty neat. Uh, but the whole scene, I don't think, is fleshed out completely. But um, he kills Debbie, and this is one of the best death scenes of the entire franchise right here. Probably my second favorite, I would say, in the entire franchise. Where he turned, Debbie like hates bugs, and he fucking turns her into a cockroach, and her arms and everything fall off. And like uh, her fuck, she falls down and just like sticky shit, like face first, and she fucking pulls up, and like a roach comes out of her skin, like her body breaks apart from the back, like the skin rips apart, and a roach comes up out of it, and it's like, but it's like still got human legs, and you find out she's actually in a roach motel, and Robert England, and he's like, he, he's Freddy, and he's like fucking carrying the roach motel, and he goes, they can check in, but they can't check out, he fucking squishes her, <laughs> I thought that was funny. But after that is when Alice is pissed off and sees Freddy on the road tries to run him over and of course they wrecked. So um, they take Dan to the uh, the police show up the emergency well the ambulance shows up they take Dan to the hospital and Alice decides to go home to get souped up in the eighties montage <laughs> to try to save Dan and defeat Freddy once and for all and it's a really fun eighties montage. <laughs> And after she gets souped up, and well, she finally took all the pictures off the mirror, and she sees herself for who she is, and got confidence in herself now. And she looks at the mirror, and she's like, "Fucking a, fucking a, baby." <laughs> I like that. You now that was a great line. Um, but one thing here, there's a plot hole here. Is like, so he has to have Alice to bring people into the dream world, and now Dan's getting put to sleep, and Alice isn't asleep. So how is Freddy invading Dan's dreams? It's a plot hole. Uh, unless I've missed something, it's a clear plot hole. Um, and then you get a cheesy line where Freddy shows up in Dan's dream. He's like, uh, he's like dressed up as a doctor or something like that. And um, Dan sees him and goes Kruger. He pulls off his like, he pulls off his mask and goes, uh, it ain't well, it ain't Doctor Seuss. And I'm like, uh, somebody could have done a little bit better than that. Their writing team, but um. Uh, and Alice like fucking jumps through the mirror in her house and goes like it's like a portal kind of thing and she lands in the fucking dream world where Dan is and that's a really cool effect I like that so she's got Dan and they go out this door and they're in like this giant fucking tube and Freddy's like spinning it around and they fall fall out this fucking window and they're in the the church well, they're in a church and um uh. Well, then after that, Dan wakes up from his uh, from his wound that he received in the dream world, I believe. Or, um, yeah, I think it's the wound he's received from being in the dream world from the fall, I think, because he was already beat up from the wreck. So the doctors wake him up out of it at the hospital. And uh, so it's pretty much now, it's, you know, Alice, Freddy, one-on-one. And the doors fling open, and Freddy's like, welcome to Wonderland, Alice. <laughs> so how the fuck is Alice going to defeat Freddy in Mortal Kombat, baby? This is a fist fight showdown with Freddy. She's got the powers. He's got the souls. You know, who's going to win, baby? Power versus souls. <clears throat> so she starts coming at Freddy. The action is really cool here. She does a couple cool flips. Really nice. <coughs> Sorry, I've been talking a lot about this movie and my voice is kind of giving out on me. Because I am just I just love this film so much. I have a blast just talking about it. Even though I don't think it's the best in the series, it's my personal favorite sequel just because it's so much fucking fun and I just grew up with it as a kid and I have the emotional attachment to it. But uh, anyway, so it's Mortal Kombat time. She starts whooping Freddy's ass and they get on top of the like the seats or whatever in the church and they're duking it out up there and you get some pretty cool, decent fight scene worthy of almost a martial and action film almost <laughs> or a martial arts film even. And they're fucking fighting. Freddy kind of gets the shit beat out of him a little bit too much. He doesn't fight back as much as I'd like, or as good as I'd like. But he gets a lot of cool stuff in, enough to where, you know, you get the idea that he's a bad motherfucker. But uh, she knocks Freddy down, and of course we know the audience. We know Freddy's not dead. And Freddy jumps up behind her and uh, says, "Uh, says you think you've got what it takes? I've been guarding my gate for a long time, bitch." And he fucking grabs her and slings her out of the way. I thought that was entertaining. Uh, that was fun. And uh, she takes this device that Sheila had given her uh, that's supposed to, like, kill bugs. And she, like, punches her hand, like, fucking straight through this thing, this electrical box on the wall. And takes the cords and sticks them to the device. And it, like, shoots, like, a laser beam out into Freddy's chest and, like, burns a hole through it. Really cool scene. Good effects. And you can, like, see Freddy's heart there. And he, like, lifts up his hands like that and just whoosh, waves it around like that. And fucking the, the hole is gone. And he's like, I am eternal. And he, like, knocks the shit out of her. And that was entertaining. That was really cool. 
the ending of this film is really fantastic, but it's really stupid how it comes about. Um, so nothing has worked. She can't defeat Freddy, so what's she going to do? And she finally remembers the entire Dream Master rhyme. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep, a master of dreams, my soul I'll keep. In the reflection of my mind's eye, evil shall see itself and it shall die. And she, like, fucking picks up this broken piece of mirror and shows Freddy his own reflection. And that causes, it's supposed to be something like, because Freddy's evil and he gets to see his, like, true evil nature, I guess, in the mirror through that magical chant because it's a, well, a magical chant, I guess, and she is the Dream Master, and when she recites it, it shows it, it gives, it gives her the ability to, like, show Freddy what he truly looks like, to truly see how evil he is, and it's kind of like the evil kills itself, I guess, and in, like, implodes on itself, which is, eh, a little stupid, but, uh, it works, I mean, it's okay, it's just a little stupid, it's, you know, it brings, it brings up a little bit too many questions, you know, like, how is this chant magical? Uh, or, or what exactly does it do, you know, it doesn't explain it 100%, but you get the idea enough to where it doesn't bother you too much, but the death scene that you get is just fucking awesome for Freddy, the death scene you get for him is just awesome, this is the best, this is the best death scene for Freddy in the entire franchise, period, in my opinion, uh, the fucking, like, that gives the souls power to, like, rise up through Freddy, and they like fucking start busting the chant like somehow gives the souls power to rise up through Freddy and they're like breaking out of his body and they fucking like rip through him and like they grab his like whole jaw and like rip it apart and it's like really fucking awesome like a hand comes out the back of his head because the souls are breaking out of his body and it's really fucking awesome special effects scene I love it best kill for best death for Freddy in the entire franchise period and the souls basically rip Freddy apart um and then he's his uh he, his body pretty much falls down. Uh, <laughs> well, his body evaporates and just his clothes fall down. And Alice kicks his glove and says, rest in hell. And all the spirits or whatever fly away off to the afterlife. And that's end of movie. Um, well, after that, you get one more scene where it shows her and Dan are together now, of course. And um, she, she's like making a wish in a wishing well. She flips a coin in it. Uh, or Dan flips the one in it for her. And... Uh, she sees Freddy's reflection in the wishing well. You don't really need that. Really need Freddy's reflection there. Once again, it's it's kind of it's kind of predictable. Like, yeah, yeah, we get it. He's probably gonna come back again. We know, but this death for him in this film feels really final, much more final than any of the deaths he's ever had in any of the other films prior to this one. So I don't know. You just don't really need that. It's just a cliche by now at this point in the series because we've had it three times before. But um. But, uh, the film still, it ends right there pretty much after Alice, like, well, Dan asks Alice what she wished for, and she says, if I tell you, it won't come true, and it ends with them walking off, you know, into the sunset, so, happy ending. So, you know, that's pretty much it, and that's the end of the movie, and you get a great rocking tune, uh, to end the film on, and keep listening to the credits, and you'll get Fat Boys, Are You Ready for Freddy, with a little bit of Robert England actually singing in it, too, which is pretty neat. But, uh, yeah, this is my favorite sequel of the franchise. It's not the best sequel. That goes for three. But, in my opinion, it, uh, my opinion quality-wise, like, not looking at it as it being my personal favorite because personal reasons, it would be the, it would be the second best, you know, it would be the third best sequel. Or it would be the third best film in the franchise. No, the fourth best. New Nightmare is better than this film, I think. But, for me, I have more of a personal connection to this film, which makes me like it, you know, personally more than New Nightmare, even though I don't think it's as good as New Nightmare. Or part three, I still like it more than those two movies personally because it's just more fun for me. But rating for the film, I'd give it two and a half stars out of a possible four. It's a good movie, uh, but it's more of just a fun movie. It's the fun nightmare. It's the really fun, souped-up MTV nightmare with quick cuts and well, music video style cuts and stuff and rocking tunes and shit. It's just a lot of fun. I love this film. I get a great time out of it. And uh, it's not as good as 3, it's not as good as New Nightmare, and it's not as good as the first film, but it's better than any of the others, uh, including Freddy vs. Jason. Even though I gave Freddy vs. Jason 3 stars, instead of like, even though I gave Freddy vs. Jason 3 stars, I really only gave it that because of um, because of the fight with Freddy and Jason. I mean, if it wasn't been for both of them being in that movie, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been as kind to it. 
to be honest, because the cast in that film is absolutely horrible, and I care way more about the characters in this one. So I still like this film more than Freddy vs. Jason, but just the fights in Freddy vs. Jason are what make me are what make me rate that film slightly higher because of the fights with Freddy and Jason. But yeah, this is still my favorite sequel in the film, in, in, in the franchise, and I really enjoy this film. And after this film is when, when the franchise goes downhill badly. <laughs> starting with Dream Child, and it just gets worse from there, except for New Nightmare. But, um, I'll see you guys again with a Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, and, uh, I really hope that you enjoy a Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, which is my personal favorite sequel, even though I don't think it's the best sequel. I do think that it's still a really good movie, and, uh, it is my favorite sequel. Maybe it isn't for some people, but I still think that you'll have a blast out of it. And I'll, I mean, just a fun time. So it's the it's the popcorn, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It's the it's the big explosive action popcorn a Nightmare on Elm Street film, which would you expect anything less from Rennie Harlan? So I'll see you guys again with a Nightmare on Elm Street Five: The Dream Child.